Stand as you are able and join us in the singing of our hymn of celebration, Standing on the Promises. That's number 374 in your hymnal.
historic confession of the Christian Church. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sit at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. seated. I have to introduce you first. <laughs> Each uh, baptism, particularly uh, infant baptism, is a sacred moment that exists between uh, parents and the church where both parties make covenants to God. Uh, and, and really it's a prayer, uh, something that they ask God to be in the middle of raising a uh, their son or their daughters, in this case, their, their daughters, uh, in a way to where from the earliest conception that one can have and thought that, that God is with them and that God will care for them. So every time that we have an infant baptism, we celebrate that. The good news is today, it's times two. So now I'd like to invite the Garcias and the Watkins up at this time. And Tommy and Sally are coming and, uh, with their daughter Eliza Chance and big sister Mims. And then uh, we have Nick and Anna Garcia uh, with their daughter Mary, he Mary Helen. So Tommy and Sally, I ask you this on behalf of the whole church. Do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? If so, answer, I do. And do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If so, answer, I do. And do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in His grace, and promise to serve Him as your Lord, in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? If so, answer, I do. And will you nurture Eliza Chance in Christ's holy church, that by your teaching and example, she may be guided to accept God's grace for herself, to profess her faith openly, and to lead a Christian life? If so, answer, I will. What name is given to this child? Come here, girl. <laughs> Eliza Chance, I baptize you now in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. May God's grace and mercy rest upon you all the days of your life. Amen. <laughs> Nick and Anna, I ask you on behalf of the whole church, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? If so, answer, I do. And do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If so, answer, I do. And do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in His grace, and promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? If so, answer, I do. And will you nurture Mary Helen in Christ's holy church, that by your teaching and example she may be guided to accept God's grace for herself? to profess her faith openly and to lead a Christian life? If so, answer, I will. What name is given to this child? <laughs> 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 
Mary Helen, I baptize you now in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. May God's grace and mercy rest upon you all the days of your life. Amen. Right now, I think she likes me. Well, almost. So you have a part to play in both of these. Do you renew your faith in God, place your trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, and place your whole trust in His grace for salvation? If so, answer, we do. We do. And will you nurture Mary Helen and Eliza Chance in faith by loving and caring for them? Will you do all in your power to increase their faith, to confirm their hope, and to perfect them in love? If so, answer, we will. I want to invite you, if you would, to turn to uh, 611, Child of Blessing, Child of Promise, and let us sing this hymn together. excited. But let's, can I hold you for a second? Okay. <laughs> let's pray. Oh God, at this moment, we give thanks for your love and your mercy. And what we pray, Lord, is these covenants that we have made, that you would be with us in the middle of those, that through our words, through our actions, they would see the love of Christ living inside of us. This we pray in your name. Amen. Let us prepare our hearts for prayer. Dear Lord, we give you thanks, Father, for this day. It is a gift from you, a gift given with love, wrapped up in ribbons full of colors found abundantly in the beauty of your creation. It's a gift wrapped with paper, when opened, gives us the blessings, the opportunities, and the challenges that were designed uniquely for each one of us. These blessings, opportunities, and challenges are intended to help our hearts grow with gratefulness and our spirits grow with faith and trust in you. Please, Lord, give us the wisdom that comes only from you to know what to do, how to react, and how to grow with the gift of today. We give you thanks for the blessings of babies, for the joy of families who have been and who are and who will be committed to serving you. Past, present, and future, Lord, all belong to you. 
Help our eyes to be open to your goodness, your righteousness, your grace and mercy. And by opening the gift of today, we may grow into the ones you created us to be, doing the tasks for your kingdom that you call us to do. We also give you thanks for the prayer your precious son taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand as you're able and join in the singing of our hymn of preparation, Wonderful Words of Life. That's number 600 in your hymnal. <laughs> in our offerings. Dear Lord, we give you thanks for everything we have comes from you. Please let our gifts and tithes be used to your glory and to further your kingdom. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Get real curious. Well, he's 
he's the one you want to see So leave a little room for God Just in case you need a friend Everyone's got rainy days It isn't so much if but when Life is like a gift we're given Every single day is new Drive around a big old car Leave a little room for God Or it won't take you very far Yeah, leave a little room for God As you're going down the road He'll not only point the way He's gonna help you with the load Yeah and thank your lucky stars above That he'll be leaving room for you He's always got some room for love Leave a little room for God, my friend And he'll have room for you Leave a little, little room for him too from Romans chapter 8 verses 1 through 4. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and to deal with sin, he condemned sin in the flesh so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. The word of God for the people of God. God. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. We welcome you again to St. Paul and ask that you register your attendance with that red pew pad, which is on the center aisle. Pass it down. And as the children come forward for the children's moment, please greet each other in Christian love. this. All right. Good morning. Good morning, guys. How y'all doing? So let me ask y'all a question. Um, so I'm talking, right? And you probably can recognize my voice, right? So if I asked you to close your eyes, close them, would you know it's my voice just by hearing it now without looking at me? You could? All right, well, keep them closed. So what? What if I talk like this? Would you know that was me? 
Or what about if it was like this? Could you recognize my voice? If, yeah. All right. Are you sure? Yeah. Well, there's an interesting passage in the New Testament, and it's in a book that's called the book of John, and it's John chapter 10. It's one of the Gospels. And you know what John 10 says? Does anybody know? You want to guess? Jesus said, my followers hear my voice. And they know me by my voice. Did you know that? So what if Jesus talked like this? You think they would still know? They wouldn't, they wouldn't know it, would it? You think so? What if he talked like this? Maybe. Well, the good news is it doesn't matter how, it doesn't matter what his voice sounded like, they still recognize his voice. Did you know that? Well, what if we talk like this? Well, he'd have to say something, but he... Yeah. Yeah, he could, he, now he might have. We don't know. But his followers knew his voice. They recognized his voice, and they followed him. So, so the good news is that it doesn't matter how he, whatever, if it was high pitch, if it was a deep voice, didn't matter. People knew that it was Jesus. And for that, we give thanks. All right? Think you could do that? All right, so let's, let's, let's say a prayer. You ready? Can everybody close their eyes? All right, you ready? Oh, God, we give thanks that uh, it doesn't matter what your voice sounds like. Uh, people hear it, and they follow. And so that's what we want to do. What we pray, Lord, is that these that sit with me, that you will watch over them, and, and that they, to, the, to the, the best of their ability, to sense your voice, to know of, of your love and mercy in their life, and that that would be a, a part of who they are to the point that how they see themselves and how they see other people, how they see the world uh, stems from that. Bless their families, O oh God, we pray. Keep them safe, and we pray this in your name. Amen.
Let, let us pray. Oh God, in these moments where we continue to worship now, where we want to be engaged by a scripture lesson, what we pray, Lord, is that in the reading of it and in the hearing of it, with the addition of your presence, that it becomes the gospel. And it is more than just what we hear, but it becomes part of who we are. And so we pray for that, O oh God. And we pray for that at this time. And we do this in your name. Amen. If you were to ask uh, 10 adults what's their greatest fear, seven to eight of them would probably say death or dying. If you have a child, it's 10 out of 10. If you ask a youth, maybe one, two, maybe three out of ten, uh, there's something about being in the youth age that you think you're invincible, so it's really not a, a topic of, that they worry about or even struggle with. But at some point when one moves from youth to adult and maybe then into older adult, that whole concept seeps back in. And it becomes a concern, sometimes even becomes a worry. For a large part of my life, that was a struggle for me. I wouldn't necessarily say fear of dying. It's uh, just the whole concept of afterlife, concept of eternity. When I was about my daughter's age, it uh, was real worry. Now, some of you know a little bit about my background. I, I grew up in Columbus, and my family went to church uh, a fair amount, meaning that we went to church more times than we didn't. And so I picked up along the way as a child from Sunday school lessons to uh, VBSs to children's camps to uh, just concepts of the church. Theological concepts. Um, I'd heard the concept of eternity or afterlife, and which meant that I, I've heard it, but couldn't explain it. Probably knew enough about theology to be dangerous more than anything else. My whole life, people have told me that afterlife was real, eternity, real. But I had no clue what it entailed, how to acquire it. I remember from the earliest age that uh, people told me that whatever it is, Jesus was in the middle of it or was a part of it, and that somehow your actions mattered. But if so, one of the questions that I often asked was, well, then what type of actions? Was there a cosmic, cosmic measuring stick that actions that were above the stick were okay, but then actions that were below it, not so much? Then I remember hearing people talk about morality. But whose morality? I mean, how moral do you have to be when it comes to something like afterlife? I mean, is there a moral bank where you, similar to what you do at your bank, you make deposits, and then when you do things that are good, you put deposits in there. But then if you do things that are not good, then you make withdrawals. And the idea is to have a positive balance and not a negative balance. Is, is that what it takes for afterlife? For the longest time, I believed in this hierarchy of morals. And the idea is the, the more good things you do, the better you are. I mean, that, that, that made sense to me. We live in a world where you earn what you keep. And so the idea that you make a list and you stack the deck with your actions that are good and, and you, you sort of climb up this ladder of, of morality and then once you reach a certain level, then whatever it is in the afterlife, then that secures it. And so I thought that would make the most sense to me. Incidentally, that's about where every world religion lives. Some have this idea of a ladder, and the more good you do, the higher up the ladder you climb, and the idea is to get to a certain place on the ladder, and once you do that, then if there is anything that has to do with afterlife, then, then that, that's taken care of, that's secured. 
Other world religions, they don't necessarily describe it in this moral ladder about doing good as much as it's the opposite of that. The idea is that you climb the ladder by getting rid of the things that are bad. So you want to divest those things, those things that lead to bad behavior. Christianity is the only one that's different. Now, there still is a measuring stick. I mean, we know that from the Bible. What we discover in both the Old Testament and the New Testament is that God says He's holy, and then therefore the people who follow God must be holy. And there's a long list of things that kind of describe what holiness means. Ten Commandments, probably the best example. But the problem sits, well, at least for me, and I would imagine it's same for you, I just can't keep them. At least not all the time. Pretty good on Sunday, right? Other days of the week, maybe. But not consistently. And so then I remember people telling me, early age, what's then needed is forgiveness. Now I have to admit, that took me forever to learn. Because it always sounded like it was too good to be true. I remember the first time of, of, a, of a, a, a cognitive understanding of the need for forgiveness for me. I was a senior in high school, and I was in church, typical Sunday, similar to this. And, uh, and I remember sitting there thinking that, you know, compared to every other senior in high school, I was about average. And so there really wasn't that much of a difference between me and the others when it, when it came to my actions. But the, there's an, there was an awareness for the, for the first time, at least the first time I could remember, that on the inside was something that left unto itself probably not would be productive at least not morally. Well, I grew up for the majority of my life in a Baptist church, and a little bit different than the Methodist church. I mean, at Methodists, we we pride ourselves in not moving in the service. We pride ourselves. We're kind of keeping ourselves, our hands to ourselves. We don't like to get out of the chair or the the pew unless to stand up to sing. But in the Baptist church, it's a little bit different, particularly at the end of the service when they they have an altar call or the last hymn and And at that time, that's what I grew up with. That was formative for me. At at the time of being a senior in high school, I was in the Methodist church. And so the the minister, typical of what we do, got through preaching. And when he finished preaching, he announced the the final hymn. And and so there was just a sense of an awareness. I, I didn't know what to do. And so I thought, well, I'll just go down and talk to him. So I remember walking down in front of the church and, and meeting the minister and, uh, he had these huge hands. They felt like weights on me. He's about six six, very tall individual, and and I went I, I went down, and then when I, I he said, "Well, hey Shane, you know," and and I said, "Well, I've been baptized, so I really don't know how this works. I don't really know the plan, but I can tell you that at least right now, I, there's just an awareness that I don't like. I know what's on the inside, to the best of my ability." And I'll still remember his prayer. He put those big old hands on me, and he looked at me, and he said, Oh, God, help Shane to know that there really is forgiveness and that there really is grace in Jesus Christ. Thankfully, none of my friends asked me what I was doing. I probably would have known what to tell them after the service. And my family was kind enough to sort of let me be. And I went home thinking, Okay, I, I, I got this. This idea with what people have told me my whole life, that belief in Jesus Christ, his life, his death, and his resurrection, that somehow that was enough if there is anything that is needed for afterlife. It lasted about a week, to be honest with you. After about day, you know, eight, nine, and ten, I remember thinking, this can't be right. I mean, no one in the world operates this way. This idea that there's just this infinite amount of forgiveness. And so for about nine or ten months, I I pestered the living daylights out of that pastor. 
And now that I'm one, I have such admiration for this individual. I mean, I, I would, I called him. He was so kind to me. He always received my calls. He made appointments for me. And they were sometime in the middle of the day. They were sometime after hours. There, there was one time I went and not, I found out where he lived. I knocked on his door Sunday afternoon. Now, I don't know. Let me just kind of give you some pastor lingo. Two o'clock to five o'clock, pastors don't answer anything. And he was kind to talk to me. Nine or ten months, pestered the living daylights out of him. See, I could understand forgiveness for first offenders. That makes sense, doesn't it? That's probably how we operate. You know, maybe he didn't know. Maybe she didn't know. So there's grace and forgiveness for that. But what about a repeat offender? and a repeat offender for the same thing. Therein lied the problem for me. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. I mean, who in the world that you know is that gracious, that kind, that loving, that forgiving? One time, yes. Two times, yes. Maybe 10, maybe even 100. But then at some point, it has to run out. And so I questioned him. Finally, he introduced me to the text that Mary Lou read for you. Romans chapter 8. Therefore, there is now no no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and to deal with sin. He condemned sin in the flesh so that The just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. The first key word in that passage is therefore. You know what that means? Therefore means that what the the writer is going to do is going to give you the results, is going to give you the conclusion of what he just talked about. And in Romans, to summarize it, those chapters from 5, 6, and 7, which is that part of the argument that that he's leading up to, that you get where where he says in chapter 8, therefore, what a person cannot do for themselves... And what the Torah or the law doesn't do, Jesus does. And we call that grace. Not a license to do whatever you want, but more of a connection between you and God. And then Paul furthers the point. He chose an analogy in the Roman world that everybody understood and one that we understand even today. He draws upon the analogy of the family. Says you are adopted into God's family. And as a member of the family, what we receive, to use our modern language, is a spiritual injection, DNA. of whatever it is in Jesus now becomes a part of you. And so what begins in what we call the Holy Spirit changes one from the inside out. Now, some of that change is instantaneous. It happens at the very moment. Some of it is gradual over time, but it's changed nonetheless, regardless of the rate of change. 
So if there is a measuring stick or any requirements for afterlife, it's met in Jesus Christ. As if that wasn't enough, Paul then in the rest of chapter 8 thinks of every imaginable barrier to what could undo this. And you have this wonderful poetic language that many people in the church, what Paul is addressing is, are there loopholes to this? And so here's here's his list. If God is for you, who really can be against you? Who can separate you from the love of Christ? Shall tribulations, distress, What about persecution? What about things physical like famine, nakedness, danger, the sword? Knowing all these things, you are more than conquerors through him who loved you. So neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth. And then here's the inclusio, nor anything in all of creation. As if to say, if there's something that I haven't thought of, will that separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord? And the answer is no. There's nothing. Do you know the reason why I tell you this story? Because there's some of you this morning who really are struggling with this fear. A close friend of our family who lives out in Texas called me last night about 10 o'clock with a horrible, horrible event that happened inside of their group of friends where someone passed away. And so everybody in their social network, this group of maybe 10 to 15 families, are struggling with this. What happens when someone dies? What do you do? What's left? So if this is your struggle, I offer to you Romans chapter 8. The grace of God really is that abundant. And the forgiveness of God really is that vast. So whatever the requirements are, they are met in him, which means you don't have to fear. This is assurance. This is peace. His love really is that abundant for you. And you don't have to fear anymore. Oh God, whether it's a concern of ours today, we know that it's someday, maybe even tomorrow, it will be. And so the struggle we have is to own the understanding that What we cannot do and what the Torah, the law, does not do, Jesus does. And the ways that we can understand that with the aid of your Spirit, help us to own that this morning. for ourselves, for our loved ones, 
And this peace that what Paul says passes any level of reasoning, understanding, becomes ours. Oh, Lord, this is our prayer. This is our need. And we pray this in your name. Amen. I want to invite you, if you would, to take your hymn books and turn with me to hymn number 605, Wash, O God, Our Sons and Daughters. Stand to your able as we sing this hymn together. 605. to receive this benediction.
washes over me You have made me new Now life begins with you Released from my chains I'm a prisoner no more My shame was a ransom Me faithfully Sold my dead and he called me his friend When death was arrested and my life began Oh, your grace so free washes over me You have made me And darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested and my life began. That's when.